So, uh, talking about NAS1, I think by now most people know what NAS1 is. It's an, basically an atmosphere fiber in runtime that's built on top of the JDM. But there's a lot of great things about it. Uh, among those is that it's, uh, it's completely open source right now. So, all of the development is done in the open JDK. So, all of the code is out there in the open JDK repo. It does ship a standard part of Oracle's uh, Java Standard Edition starting with version 8. Uh, and it is accessible through standard Java ECMAScript APIs. It doesn't really, you don't really have to learn an API to use it. Uh, the, the script APIs that are in Java since Java 6 um, are used to, to access it. It does have its own package uh, if you want to tailor. Uh, some aspects of the usage, you can use that. We will actually do that in, in, in my today's presentation. Uh, you can run it from a command line. There is a JJS command, which is a pretty silly thing. There is a lot of uh, utilities in Java that start with J. So you have JPS, which is the PS for all the Java processes. And then, obviously, the JavaScript launcher that uses Java is therefore named JJS. Another interesting tidbit that will also be emphasized during this talk is that NASA does not have an interpreter. It is complete, the uh, code is always compiled in bytecode, so what we end up running is always Java classes that are dynamically compiled and loaded into the JVM as the, as the code executes. Why do we even want to uh, create NASA form? Well, it is we wanted something that has full ECMAScript 5 compliance, so modern, modern JavaScript. Uh, with modern code base, we had Rhino before, but it, it was showing its age. And one thing that is not really quite often brought up is that it's also security-minded. We used to integrate Rhino before, and Rhino was created before the Java 2 security model actually came in place. And uh, with NAS for instance, we ship it as integrated part of the JDK, it has to be secure, it has to, the, the, the internal architecture has to pay a lot of attention to, to, to actually, um, to, well, all the, all the intricacies of the Java security model. We also use it as a proving ground for Invoke Dynamic, and we are also using it to flesh out the requirements for general, general dynamic languages uh, support on the Java platform, which is, which is pretty much my long-term goal with all of this. We do a lot of uh, performance work. Uh, JavaScript is a wonderful target language if you enjoy doing compiler optimizations as I do, because uh, it is super easy to write a very slow language runtime. You just do an AST interpreter and box everything as objects, and hey, it runs. It is not slow, but it runs. Um, you can spend a lifetime writing optimizations in your runtime, and the more dynamic the language is, the less is explicitly given statically, uh, the more work your optimizing compiler has to do to actually uh, provide you with acceptable performance. So, you know, I'm, I think I have the job security pinned down pretty well with this. However, not all optimizations apply equally well, so I actually want to show you some good practices for integrating NAS1 that will make you uh, make sure that when you use it, it is actually fast. Now, when, when I accepted to give this talk, uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, and uh, um, I realized that by, by giving that talk about how do you need to use NAS one in order to make things faster, I sort of painted myself in a corner, really, so I set up myself a trap, because, I mean, I developed this runtime, so why don't I just make it so that it's fast without any intervention on your part, right? So basically by saying that, uh, hey, I don't, well, not I, I'm part of a team, but we wrote this one time, 
And here's what you do, need to do in order to, for it to perform really well. I might as well admit incompetence, saying I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, because why don't I just make it so that you don't need to do anything? So, as, as a somewhat experienced speaker, I realized that there's really one way to uh, go about it, which is uh, emphasize everything we did well, and of course, shift the blame for everything that isn't. So I will be trying to do that in the next few slides. So if it works well, we did it. If it doesn't work well, it's your fault. Uh, I will show you the nice things first. So NASA's internals are pretty smart by now. We did actually a lot of, of uh, fairly crazy stuff with a small team in a relatively small amount of time. And Java 1.8 came out None of this actually shipped. Uh, most of this, these three things that you see here actually shipped with Java 1.8 update 40. Uh, we do specialized compilation of functions. So if you invoke a function with int parameters, we will compile a special version of that function that takes advantage of the fact that the parameters passed in were ints or doubles, not generic objects. Once we start generating code, we will actually do static type inference on local variables so that as far as possible we will try to keep everything narrow and primitive. And for those things that we cannot figure out how to, uh, we cannot prove statically uh, at compile time that uh, this particular variable is an int, and in JavaScript it's really easy to get at a, uh, to a point where you can prove anything about a expression. A thing such easy as, well, easy, simple, as retrieving a property from an object, retrieving an element from an array, invoking a function. What will the return type of all of these be? You have no idea. Generally, you have no idea. So what we did is that we also built a framework where you can, uh, we do optimistic assumptions about these types. What's an optimistic assumption? Basically, the optimistic assumption is, hey, let's presume it will be a 32-bit signed integer. Why not? because JVM handles those well. And when those are evaluated, we need to do something. We'll see what the something is. But where the NASA can blame you, or I need to shift the blame somewhere else, is how do you integrate it into your job-based system? And whether you are structuring your code in a ways that are too hard for the runtime to actually reason about. So, I want to show you how the parameter type specialized compilation works. What we have here is that if you define one single function which squares whatever is passed into it, and then you invoke it twice, once with an int and once with something that's not an int, it will actually generate two versions of the code. First version of the code will take an int and hope that it can return an int. And as you can see, it's a very simple JVM code, it loads the two arguments, invokes a multiplication function. It doesn't, doesn't do IMAL, which is just a built-in bytecode, and there's a reason for that, and the reason is that it needs to handle overflow, because numbers in JavaScript don't overflow, because JavaScript inherently, at specification level, it only knows about 64-bit floating point numbers, so we cannot just overflow a multiplication. We must smartly then expand the type into double. And if you later on invite it, uh, invoke it with a, with a double parameter, it will generate another, another version of the function. And let me show you this. I'm still getting used to. Uh, so, uh, square function, here it is. Same code as on the slide. And if we now run this code with dash print code, a lot of things happen, and I will just start to try to find the. So, first time it's invoked, as you can see, we will generate a version that takes an int, returns an int. And it does what I said, loads the arguments, does the invocation does the multiplication returns. And somewhere later on here, you can actually see the output, the print, the print the result saying 500 squared, 
250,000. Afterwards, it will generate the second version of the code. As you can see, all code is lazily generated. NASA is so lazy in code generation that it does not even compile the top level program until you actually invoke it. So when you compile a script, we will do some parsing, we'll do some preparations, we'll store some metadata that's needed for efficient code generation later on, but we won't even generate the program because then it would be a special case and we didn't want to do a special case. So if a particular variant of a function is not yet generated, we will only generate it as part of invocation. So it's, the, it's when you invoke the function, if it's not linked yet, then if the code is not ready, then the compiler kicks in, compiles the function, links it, and goes on. So as you can see, the double version of the function is only generated after we printed the result of the invoking the int version of the function. And at the end of it, because there is a lot of other things going on, you have the, the actual output for that. So if you if you just run the same code without without print code, then obviously you just get the get the expected output without any without any code generation frills. So that's parameter type specialized compilation helps a lot. Step of type inference. So I will I will be using the uh, Octane crypto benchmark uh, later on to demonstrate things. And uh, here's a little hot function from uh, from the crypto benchmark. This this one is uh, the core of the benchmark. It's doing a lot of uh, calculations. You can see there's a lot of uh, int arithmetic. Uh, Bitwise ends, shifts, uh, retrieval from arrays, multiplications, uh, additions, etc., etc. Et so a lot of everything going on. So last one, if you do not use optimistic typing, this kind of typing where you presume everything is an end, uh, optimistic typing is actually not on by default. We we had it shipped with Java 8 used 40, but it's off by default. Then you will get to type something like this, but it's really not so bad. Uh, if you uh, do I have a laser pointer here? Excellent. So ooh, too much caffeine. It works. So as you can see these will be ints and this these will be ints. But then pretty much the story stops here. The parameters are weird because some of those are objects, even though they don't necessarily have to be, and some of those are doubles. It again depends on what could we infer at the caller site and then generate a particular signature. Uh, but as you can see, problem spots. Uh, decrement operator ends up promoting its, its operand to double. And here, since we have multiplications, they might overflow the in, they will be doubles. And oh my god, this guy here, hell, it became an object. Why? Well, because in a non optimistic world, there's an array read here, and you can't know what will you get back from that array. So, what if it's a string? And if it's a string, then JavaScript being the wonderful language that it is, this plus operators must. Uh, act as concatenation operators, right? So it has to presume that this poor L, even though we actually know this will be an int, it, it conservatively has to assume an object. And C becomes a double because of the this multiplication here. And then since the C is returned, then the return type of the function itself is a double. So not so bad, but you know, nothing to write home about either. With optimistic typing, if you turn on optimistic typing, then, as you can see, we will already the caller sites will make a lot of assumptions that uh, that uh, the parameters are ints, and all the trouble spots are gone because we will presume that decrement never overflows. We, we could sort of figure it out because if we knew that, but but we can't know whether we get a positive number in the first place, unfortunately. So we will presume this doesn't overflow. We will presume these multiplications don't overflow and the addition doesn't overflow either, so this might stay an int. And if we also presume that all of these guys are ints, then this might re uh, remain an int as well. Um, we will eventually figure out that these two expressions are not ints, but that's all. <laughs> so this is great. If you, When we compile this, we get code that's as efficient as if you just uh, wrote that same code with types in Java. Again. Okay. 
I can run one round of it and an awful lot of code gets generated so we'll have to find the one that we are interested in, the AM3 one and I think this is, this is the last version probably. So as you can see, um, I mean I don't really need you to look very deeply into this, but as you can see, it's all int operations all the way. There's nothing else. It's just that at various places when we do invoke dynamic and we are trying to retrieve an element from an array, we will just make assumption that it's all an int. And if we scroll down all the way to hopefully finding the local variable table, you can see that this is an object, w is an object, that is an object that really this and WRA are objects and everything else is ints, which is great. So, synergy, that's a, that, that's, that's a great word that's been hijacked by, by marketing, but it really means that multiple agents are collaborating to achieve something that's more than the sum of its parts. And in this case, we really can do that because look at this. This is twice as high order function. It's a function that takes another function and applies it twice to an operator. To an operator, sorry. Um, so what will the types of this actually be? So if we invoke twice with, with we have an increment function with pass it five, what types will we end up with? And then we invoke it with 5.1. Again, what do we end up with? So what's nice is that if you, let me just stand back for a moment. If you do this, not this one. Yeah, here it is. So, what happens if we run this is. We will have one version of twice generated which gets an int operand and hopes that it can return an int result. And then what it will do is it will it will be loading its uh, it will be loading its uh, function operands and trying to invoke them and hope that they too will be an int and in that case it will return in. In that case itself it can return an int. And then sometime later, after we generated this. We will immediately generate the first version of the increment function, which also takes an int and returns an int. I mean, really, it does statically we can infer that uh, we load it, we add one to it, and we will return an int, hoping there will be no overflow. And then sometime later, when we do, we will do a version that takes a double, but we will still be hoping it actually will be able to return an int. We don't know whether the function supplied will be returning a double. So this guy starts running, and first thing it does, it invokes f. So we will need to, f is now, again, the increment, but we need to generate a new version that takes a double, and statically we will know that it returns a double, because static analysis actually figures this out. So we will have a double-double version. And now the execution goes back, and what happens is that we actually create a new code for double, where this first invocation already realized that, hey, I, this first invocation will return a double, but maybe the second one will still return an int, so I might still be able to overall have an int result. And then, this will prove to be false as well, so we will be generating a yet another version of the function, this time twice, takes a double, returns a double, it will invoke twice the function, and both of these times it now knows that they will return double, so its own type will also be a double. So what happened here is, and I can show you the same thing in a nicer way, first we have the print which kicks off the whole thing. It hopes that it might be getting back an int, and as you can see, those are the, the types that I show in the little square brackets. So we know already that uh, the increment will be, a, uh, will be returning double, but the function itself, it hopes that even if it passes a double into f, it will be getting back an int. So that's the, that's this part. And then it hopes that if it passes that int to f again, it will get an int, so it can return an int. But then, the 
this will actually prove to be false. The function returned a double, but it still hopes that if it passes it into another invocation, it might still get back an int. It doesn't, and in that case, already, these are propagated outwards. So there's a lot of conservation going on. On the other hand, the int version still remains in memory. We keep them. So type specialization means that uh, one function has, will have multiple type specialization live type specialization based on parameters live. So if you later on again invoke it with an int, you don't pay the penalty of running the double version because it will actually go to the int version that we call the int version of the, uh, of, of the increment. So basically what happens here is that lazy compilation, parameter type specialization, uh, static type inference, and optimistic typing work hand in hand to make sure that you always generate, we always generate uh, the tightest version of the code that can run with the data that is thrown at it, so that we don't widen to doubles or to objects anytime we don't have to. So, how do we deal with running code, by the way? Because everything I've shown you, right? So we need to replace the code while it's running. So the twice function, when it calls ink and gets back a double instead of an int, it just cannot run with the int version anymore. So what it has to do with it at this point, we do actually have an elaborate system of exception handlers there that make it so that it jumps out into the caller. The caller is linked so that it catches the exception, derails into the compiler, compiles the new version of the code, then it compiles a one-time continuation because we need to resume the computation from that point on, and it jumps back into the, uh, the continuation. Uh, what's nice is that we actually managed to do all of this without any JVM level tricks, so it's a pure bytecode solution, so if, even if you took something that's not an Oracle JVM, NASA would, work, uh, would be able to work all of its magic. All right, so I'll show you some integrations now. Uh, let's write a small web application. There is a ton of very exciting uh, web frameworks out there these days. Vertex is using uh, JavaScript and NASA as one of its implementations. There are Java ports of Node.js, etc., etc. They all have a huge drawback, which is that I never actually found the time to learn any of them. So I will just use the plain old servlet API. Shows my age, I guess. Uh, I just use Jetty as an embedded server. So I also, I mean, you have to, you have to forgive me for I'm spending most of my time on the compiler land, so I don't really do web applications a lot. So it will be ugly. And the example itself is somewhat contrived, but bear with me. So what I do is I'm taking this Google Octane benchmark uh, crypto, which is doing an RSA encryption decryption. And the logic is entirely written in JavaScript. It is a reasonably complex computation. It doesn't do any I.O. Uh, I'm not showing you anything that does I.O. because JavaScript doesn't have built-in I.O. libraries. and. So you would just end up using Java's I/O facilities, and there is really no JavaScript performance story in that. So uh, it performs just as well as if you invoke it from Java, right? <laughs> so it doesn't do, do a lot the web application. It shows you a text, and then uh, shows you a text field, and then it uh, encrypts it, shows the encrypted version, and then for verifica verification, it shows you the decrypted code. Uh, sorry, the text which should match the original plain text. So how would you go about this? And why we need to talk about this is that uh, JavaScript language and a lot of dynamic languages don't give you any kind of a specification for compile time, runtime, etc. I mean, JavaScript execution specification is pretty much Here's some source code, here's how you run it. It doesn't tell you anything about data sharing, it doesn't, tell, it doesn't have a concurrency story, it doesn't tell you you need to compile it, it doesn't even tell you you need to parse it. For, I mean, sort of does because there are early errors that are syntactic errors that need to be caught before you start running, but that's pretty much it. It doesn't even tell you that you need to parse it. It, it. it doesn't tell you parse, compile, run. It tells you, here's some source code, here's how you run it. And when you integrate, you need to yourself figure out a sweet spot 
between the source code and running the code that fits your expectations. So one thing that you can do is that on every server's request, you can just instantiate the brand new script engine and just evaluate the JavaScript code in it because, you know, it fits the specification. That's the most naive approach that you can take. Just, uh, I have a server that I will show you in a moment. So when you go into the evaluate function, which is invoked on every HTTP request, you can just ask your script engine manager to get you a mask on engine. You evaluate the script into it that comes from an internal URL. And then you can just uh, throw your variables into it and evaluate the encryption and decryption, decryption functions and return that. You can do it. Uh, it will work. Uh, so. I named all my classes with a number in them so I can just not get confused which one is the next one that needs to be demonstrated. So here's the most naive one. It's uh, doing pretty much what I just show you, show, show you on the slide. Uh, if you run this guy, and I have an Apache Bench uh, command line here that does what it can do on the UI. But we can, of course, try the UI as well. So if we do this and hit submit, we will wait for a bit. Now it's not so bad, actually. It's like uh, two, two seconds. It, it's horrible. But... So if you now do a test and we test for, you know, thousand requests. Come on, it should print hundred any time now. Maybe not. I, I'm kidding you. I, I was thinking, you know, I could really cut down on the slides if I just had my audience stare at a blank screen waiting for some album to show up. Live benchmarking, super exciting, except if you, I mean, if you lost snail races, then that might be. Uh, no, we won't. We won't be doing this. And it's horrible. So for those few requests, those 27 requests I managed to do in this time, as you can see, the, the percentages is horrible. So, so what's happening here? Uh, as you can see, the most naive approach is not terribly efficient. Uh, how does it perform? Not really well. So these are recorded stats from when I ran it at home and that I'm going to subject to a full run now. Um, what it's doing is that if you, if you try to visualize J visual V and what's happening, then, I mean, this is artificial. This is Jet is blocking the Ray pole. But then you have something like dynamic, call site, the link internal, call site initialize, uh, code installer run, install class, create through link. So what's happening here? Classes are being generated, bootstrapped, and linked each and every time you start it from scratch. Because you're creating a new engine, you don't have any context, it doesn't know that there was a previous engine that already compiled this code. The code is loaded, parsed, compiled, linked every single time. So you can do this. We won't be happy. So, what's the solution? Let's try using a single engine instance. So, the, the significant difference here is that we just, we just have a static engine instance. In server world, you wouldn't use a static, you would use something that is bound in the server context, but they don't want to uh, be too pedant about it and lose the actual point that I'm trying to demonstrate. And then you can just take this engine, create a new bindings. This is an interesting thing and then evaluate your script into it uh, and then invoke encryption and decryption by retrieving the functions which are first class objects by name pass now let's do this pass the actual arguments and then create the result so this guy actually performs much better so if I were to run this and nah, I won't if, if for whatever reason I finish this talk early and you don't feel like rushing out for lunch, you might have fun with running these, but otherwise I'll just show slides and ask you to believe me. You do remember the first slide and I, was, I told you that I have a blank check to also lie, right? So uh, this looks much better, right? So it goes 50, per, uh, 50 percentile is 200-ish milliseconds, uh, 99th is not so bad, but 95th is or uh, yeah. It's, not where happiness is, but uh, it's, it, 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 it's already much better. However, 
the 100 percentile is three seconds, and that's the first time you invoke the engine. That's when it actually needs to parse the, well, load the script classes itself, the engine itself needs to be loaded, and then it needs to, uh, to, uh, to re and parse and compile and, and bootstrap the NASA itself because it wasn't loaded before. So, uh, there is actually code caching with a single engine instance. That's a really good reason to use a single engine instance. Uh, NASA is also smart enough that if you pass a URL reader to Evel, then it will, it actually checks whether the reader that you passed in is a URL reader, and if it is, it extracts the URL, sees whether it already has code compiled for a script coming from that URL, and it will just use the already cached class for it. Uh, so it's much better. Uh, so it's much better in this regard. So even though here you see new URL reader, so you are opening a reader and you're passing to Evel, it will actually not even read the file. If you look at the URL and say, well, yeah, I've seen this already, so it will just use the cached version. Still, it's not too good practice to just be opening readers because it's I.O. At the, at the end and something might end up being pre-buffered. So if you don't even read the script, why would you open a reader? So another thing that you can do is you can use the compilable interface and the compile script, which is basically the script engine can be cast to something that's called compilable. And uh, this, is, this is also part of the JavaX script API. And then you can compile the script and obtain a, well, hopefully optimized version, a pre-compiled version. And then later what you can do is you just evaluate it. You evaluate the script into a script context, which is a brand new space for your global variables. And if we do this now, it gets better. So as you can see, surprisingly, even just opening a reader, it it does shave off time, so it gets, gets better. Again, it's still not like super good, but it's, 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 it's still better. Um, this got slightly higher, but it doesn't really matter. But if you look at the 50 percentile, it actually got better. So, yeah. I mean, we have to re-evaluating everything. So even though the script is compiled, we are still doing an evil into a variable space. So, no, we are not really reevaluating everything because this crypto test is actually most of what it does is it defines functions. So what happens is that in that binding space, it will just populate a bunch of functions into it, fun function objects. So it will say that AM4 will be variable AM4 will be bound to a function object and you know, a few things. But nothing really terribly expensive happens. So a function object is just a tuple in NAS or in JavaScript in general of its lexical scope and code. It's cheap to construct because code is only created once and, and the lexical scope is created pretty much just uh, well once on evaluation. And then you are just basically creating those tuples. So functions are actually cheap once they are compiled. So we have this flexible separation of compiling runtime that I was telling you about, is that you have a discrete set of choices how do you want to split the tasks of going from, here's my source code, here's something running. So if you, if you use compiled script in between, you are, you are hitting a pretty good sweet spot. Of course, there's further time detail of programs global variable namespace. So, what if we just use the single bindings object? So, we are defining those functions we are creating a new global scope for JavaScript program because that's what JavaScript semantics is about. And we are just, on each evaluation, we'll populate it with the functions and then we will invoke two of those functions, which will invoke the rest of them. So what if we did save ourselves a little bit of time and space and just use, you know, single bindings because the engine itself actually has bindings built in. So if you just as part of the static initialization, you just do evaluate your reader into the engine, which has a built-in bindings already. Bindings is just a global scope space, a global variable space for the script. And then we statically extract the two functions, which are stateless, right? And then we just call them. We just call those, pass the plain text, the ciphertext, and see what we get back. So, 
How far does this perform? Wow, look at that. We went down from 150 and like 95% it was 500 milliseconds. We actually went down to something really decent, like 35 to 60. Uh, the worst case is still the worst case. It, it, it won't improve. But the rest of them, you know, this, this actually looks okay. Looks, uh, this, I think, uh, I might even go to the trouble and just take this particular version and we'll run it. Single, what do I have it? One, two, new bindings, three, single bindings, yeah, single bindings version. This is the code version. This is the code version that does that. As you can see, I evaluate in a static block, I evaluate the reader and I extract the functions, and then in the actual evaluation, I just invoke them. So if we now run our little web application with this, This might be actually something that you might spend half a minute on. Or maybe not. We'll see how fast this will come up. But yeah. So the first time we request it will, will be slower because the first one takes three seconds. But as you can see, it, uh, it improves. So the, the, this is already much better. So this is something that we can, we, we can actually afford to uh, look at as part of the talk. So, yeah. so Even better, of course, there is a little foreshadowing here, but we'll get back to that. And finally, what if we turn on, on the optimistic typing? To do that, we need to do a different kind of usage, which is you need to use the NASCON API, some of the JavaScript API. So you actually need to ex ex obtain an explicit NASCON script engine factory and pass it a command line argument. You can do this to actually obtain engines with, with customized command line arguments uh, for NASCON in general. If you do this, what you get is it goes down from like the 15% the goes from 25 milliseconds to 12 milliseconds, it's two to three times faster, actually. So it's great. Uh, this is, this is the fastest we can do. However, it's slower to start up. You can see that the initialization actually went from, from 3 seconds to 4.7, and that's not bad, and that's not good. Optimistic is slower to start, because when a type cannot be proven statically, then we will have to presume it's an int, and when the assumption fails, we recompile the code. Uh, I, timed, uh, I measured the crypto benchmark has 35 functions that have recompiled 67 times total, and that's part of the startup cost. Optimistic is slower to start because in this example I took a random recompiled function. Uh, like this dot array turns out to be an object, so it has to be recompiled for that. The adds uh, invocations uh, are not ints, the y dot array is not an int. So this function is recompiled one, two, three, four times before it can run. However, our dot array is actually actually ended up not being recompiled, and that's a great benefit of not having a separation between compile time and runtime. The one clever thing we can do is that compiler, when it kicks in to recompile a function, we can actually um, we can actually make it so that uh, it peaks at side effect free expressions and proactively evaluates them to see whether it's an object, and if it is, then it will de-optimize it in one go. So we do like batch the optimizations for, for side effect free uh, expressions. Um, I would go with the car analogy for this, but uh, I'll skip it because I think we will be out of time soon. Um, unfortunately, yeah. Nasim has a type in for cache. And this is probably the last thing I will tell you about. If you want to improve your performance uh, for uh, optimistic, what you can do is you can use the system property and tell it how many files do you want to have in the cache. It's off by default because you don't want NASM to depend on writing anything to disk. But all these decisions of what types were encountered during the execution can be persisted into a local cache, which is in your system cache directory, so you can nuke it if you don't need it. And then next time you start up your system, it will actually remember those decisions. So one good thing that we can do is that not optimistic, you remember the worst data was like three seconds for this example. In optimistic it was 4.7 and with the type cache I actually got it down to 3.5. So it's still a trade-off, but we'll need to live with this uh, from now on. There's not uh, much we can do about it. So uh, okay. 
I have more material. If you uh, feel like you'd like to uh, talk about it, then uh, I will be happy to catch up with you um, later on. But I think this is probably all I can do in this time frame. So, there is a, I have a few more slides on, on making it, uh, I'm checking out the stateful execution and uh, uh, you know what, catch me offline if you're interested. Because uh, I think uh, everybody is eager to uh, get to lunch, and uh, unfortunately, because of the scheduling, I actually had to stop a little bit late. So I will, I will, I will have to, I will have to leave you with uh, with a few parts of the talk that are not presented. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you.